All right, we're in Matthew chapter 7. We're continuing with this Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we are continuing with Jesus preaching to uh, Jews under the law of Moses. And he's, uh, he's telling them where they got the law wrong where they have interpreted the law wrong. And, uh, and he's trying to tell them how to get into the kingdom that he's getting ready to set up. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus is Messiah. He is uh, the Savior of Israel. Uh, he's the king. He's there to offer the kingdom to them. And so this Sermon on the Mount is how do you get into that kingdom? And how do you stay, into that, stay in that kingdom? And, and we've talked about this at length. That kingdom is not spiritual. That kingdom is physical. That is uh, the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're talking about, how to get into the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and we're in uh, Matthew 7, and we're going to start in verse 9. And here is a passage of Scripture uh, that... Uh, We talked we talked about that some last week, didn't we? Let me make sure I don't want to lift nothing out. Okay. We're gonna read verse seven through eleven. I mean uh, verse nine through eleven. Hmm. Well, let me back up because he's talking about uh, let's just back up to seven to give us a little context it says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened or, and here we go or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If, then you, if, the, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So we're talking about prayer here. We're talking about asking God uh, and praying to God. We talked about praying last week. And... Uh, and, and God's saying, hey, uh, don't worry, I know how to answer your prayers the way you need it answered. And he says, uh, uh, you know, what, he's, what he's, trying to he's trying to compare how much better his answer to the request that his children make than what we as humans give our children. And, but that's how we can think. We can't think of, you know, God's above our thoughts. We can't understand that. So he, he always is going to point to something that we can understand. Uh, to show us something about himself. And he's basically saying, hey, look, y'all know how to treat your children right. You give them good, good gifts. Don't you think I'm going to do the same for you? And he knows so much more about what a kid needs than what you know that you think you're kidding. I mean, I've, got, I've given my kids lots of things that I thought were good that ended up being terrible for them. The worst thing I ever gave my child, and I, I, I'll guarantee you it, it, it caused more grief and more harm and more damage in their life than anything. It's incalculable, the damage that this caused my child. I put a Game Boy oh, yep. in this kid's hand at a, how old, Leslie? Age uh, five, maybe six. He had that ADD, you know what I mean? He was running all everything. And you know what? Put a Game Boy in his hand, and it's just like, whew. Mm -hmm. You could think, you could do, you could, ah, and that boy just sit over that corner for hours and play that thing, and it just absolutely destroyed his life. I thought it was good, but it wasn't. See, God would have known what that would have done. I didn't. And so that's an extreme example. That, but what I'm telling you is God is not going to give his children something that's going to harm them in the end. And that isn't true for us. We can think we're doing good and not. It says right here, verse 1, how does verse 11 make you feel? Well, let's hone in on verse 11. He says, if then, if you then being evil. So what has God said to you right there? You're evil, right? You're wicked. 
So, so whenever you're worried about God and what he can do for you and give you or whatever according to your uh, request, God in return says, you're wicked and evil and yet you still can give good things to your children. So how does it make you feel uh, that, uh, that God calls you wicked? Somebody read Romans 3.10 there. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. So who does that cover? <coughs> Every man, everybody in my, at mankind, right? No, not one. So, so, so you let this sink, sink into your head here. The most righteous person that you've ever known in your life. The most godly, saintly person that you can't find one wrong thing to say about that person is wicked. They're wicked. And deserves hell. Now, that's not the way we judge, right? We, 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 we always compare between humans. We look at this human and they say, well, man, this human is, uh, you know, is saintly. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you, you, there's nothing I can find going on in this person's life that I can criticize. And then you get all the way over here and you look at Adolf Hitler or a child molester or murder or whatever. And so we're judging on human standard. Now God don't judge on human standard. God is perfect. He's perfect. Uh, and that's the standard he judges by. It's perfection. And that's the standard that's going to get you in heaven is perfection. If you're not perfect, you're not going to get in heaven. Everybody just needs to get that around in their mind. Unless you are perfectly, 100% sinless, you're not going to make it. Now, can you ever do that? So what do we need? We need a Savior. We need a Savior that can make us perfectly, 100% sinless. Because we can't do it on our own. It says right there, no, not one. But what, what do we have all over the world today? Every single religion, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this if we get to the end of this lesson. Every single religion in the planet has one thing in common. It is, what do you do in order to get to heaven? Now, they're all different depending on religion. The Catholics got in one way and the Jews got another way. And the Muslims got away, and the Hindus got away, and the Mormons got away, and the Jehovah's Witness got away, and the Seventh Day Adventists got away, and any other cult or religion or whatever, they all have one thing in common. They explain what you need to do to get to heaven. And the big secret is there is nothing you can do to get to heaven. That's why all of those folks that follow all those religions are going to go to heaven. No matter how good they are, no matter how much they love their children, how much benefit they've worked to their communities, and how salt of the earth people, they're all going to burn for eternity because they thought they could get to heaven based on what they were doing. And it's tragic, and it's sad, and that's where the devil gets you. See, people think the devil uh, is, is all about devil worshiping and all that stuff. He don't. Hey, he's got all of that. Devil's playground is religion. Mm -hmm. Devil's playground is the church. That's where he does his business. He's subtle. You know, that snake's subtle. Somebody's out there worshiping the devil. There ain't nothing subtle about that, is it? I mean, you've got them figured out. You know, I mean, it ain't no big deal. These people that get up there on the, you know, these new modern rock people, you know, and they're, they're doing all this satanic stuff, and they got 666. I mean, that's not subtle. Everybody can see that. Oh, Satan works through the pulpits, churches, and the people sitting in the pews. That's where he that's where he lives. You got to be careful about that. You got to be careful. And so, uh, no one not righteous. Uh, and then it goes on to say, uh, if 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 you know how to good good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, here's what we need to remember whenever you're thinking about, you're, you're, you're trying to figure out what the Word is doing. Remember, the Jews, and we're talking to Jesus, is talking to Jews, primarily are dealing with physical things. 
The, the Jews have been given physical promises, physical land, and, uh, and their blessings are physical. And so that's why you see so many today, uh, especially amongst your Charismatics and your Pentecostals, they try to steal the blessings that God gave Israel. They'll go back in the Old Testament and they'll talk, they'll talk about all these material things that God wants to bless you with. We need to give you a little more room. Please. No, got it. But what do we know in the church age? Number two says, what are the good things the Father gives his children in the church age? Now, that don't mean that God, it was wrong to ask God to bless you for material things. I do. You know, God, you know, bless our business, bless our finances, you know, bless our health, all that's fine to ask all those things. But what good things is it that, uh, that God gives us in this age? Somebody read Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, he says, when he, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So the context of Ephesians 4, 8 is whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected. You remember, he went down. Where did he go for three days? Hell. Yeah, right down there to the heart of the earth. It said he preached to the spirits in prison. And remember, we've studied uh, hell, Hades. We've studied that, com that, that place down there where Jesus went. And remember, it's divided into two compartments. And you can communicate between them. You've got Abraham's bosom, and you've got the bad side of hell. And, you know, Jesus went down there. And uh, can anybody uh, remember why did the Old Testament saints go to hell, into the paradise side of hell? You remember, hell is divided. Hades, hell, whatever you want to call it, in the center of the earth is divided in between paradise and the bad part. They were the same. Yeah. There you go. Yep, they weren't perfect because they had not been made perfect because nobody is perfect until Jesus shed his blood on the cross. So those Old Testament saints were down there in, in prison, but it was it's paradise. Trees. I mean, we don't we don't understand that. But anyway, God, I mean I mean, hey, God do anything, man. <coughs> Have you ever read that account in Genesis, you know, and there was light before there was the sun? That God is light. God is life. That's why you could have uh, trees and a garden and all of that stuff down there in the center of the earth. People say, well, that's a fairy tale business. Uh, man, if you think that's a fairy tale business, then you think Jesus being raised from the dead is a fairy tale business. Mm -hmm. But here's what happened. And so, uh, so when Jesus is resurrected, he brings all those Old Testament saints with him. He led captivity captive. And then what did he do? Said what? He gave gifts to men. Well, what kind of gifts are we talking about here? Somebody read 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus cursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities both gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given each one for the profit of all. All right, so what we're talking about here is God gave each and every one of his children when they became born again, he gave them spiritual gifts of some kind. Now, you got to figure out what that is because what did it say there at the end? Given to each one, that means that every one of you in here that's a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has spiritual <clears throat> gift. And it says, for the profit of all. So that means you're supposed to be using whatever gift you have to benefit other people. And here's the sad, sad thing is many in the church today first don't even realize they have spiritual gifts and if they do they don't use them they don't use them to profit all and uh, and so those are the good gifts that we've been given now look I'm not saying God doesn't bless you some uh, 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 with material things but there's no promise of that I'm going to tell you where we're in trouble in this country 
And it's this prosperity gospel nonsense that has infiltrated all of the churches. And people get to think, well, if bad things are happening to me, then, then God's abandoned me. If you've been taught your whole life, if you just live right, do good, and have enough faith, you're going to have a, a good job, and your health is going to be good, and you can be healed if you get sick or whatever, and blah, 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 and that don't happen, what are you going to do? You're going to get not more than discouraged. A lot of people abandon the faith. Why, why, why do I have cancer? You know, why did I lose my child? Well, I'm going to tell you what, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't promise you wouldn't get cancer. He didn't promise you wouldn't get your child. Again, read that book. Read that book. I dare you. I dare you to read this book. It's sitting right here. Somebody pick that book up and go read it and see if you can get through the first five chapters of it. And you just see what the Lord Jesus Christ will let his children go through. There is no promise. The promise we have is, I will never leave you nor for Satan. And so good gifts, good gifts do not always equal what we consider good and blessing. And you've got to get your mind wrapped around that because there'll come a time in your life that you'll be tested. Yes, sir. I think the, I think the gifts that he gives us not only are the ones that we are used to be able to use to help others or to work throughout the whole church or the whole body of Christ, but I think it's the gift of the peace that he gives us to help us to be able to know where we stand with God and what, you know, the, the Bible says the peace of God passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. We'll keep our hearts and minds which are fixed on Him. Yep. The key word there is that we see fixed on Him. That's right. That's right. The biggest, the greatest gift God ever gave anybody is right there. Yeah. Is that book. Right. It's that book. All right. Verse 12. Therefore, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. What's that called? The golden rule. See what I got written up on that board? How can following the golden rule send you to hell? Do you think following the golden rule can send you to hell? Yes. You're right, it can, and it sends lots of folks to hell. That golden rule sends lots and lots and lots of folks to hell. We try to think that we can do it first. Before they do it to us. You know? And so, what, first of all, we need to remember we're talking now about how to get into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? The literal, physical kingdom of Israel. We're not talking about how to get into heaven. We're not talking about how to, your, your soul is saved. Jesus, and, and, and look what it says. For this is the law and the prophets. And there are, there are other renderings of this uh, in other Gospels that I could have put in there. But basically what Jesus is saying is if you do those things right there, if whatever you want men to do to you, also do to them, this is the law and the prophets, then you're going to fulfill all of those uh, points of the law. Because basically what you're doing there is you're putting yourself second and everyone else in front of you, including God Almighty. He's, no, he's the one, the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the golden rule. And that is what, uh, that is what uh, uh, God would have us do. Uh and that's the golden rule, and it's a good rule, and it's a rule everybody ought to live by. It's really a rule that every Christian should, within their heart, already be doing without being told to do it. And so it says, "This is the law of, for this is the law and the prophets." And uh, and the question is, when did the uh, when did the golden rule stop being a part of the plan of salvation? So remember that these Jews, if the Jews that were, uh, uh, were sitting there on that side of that hill by Sea of Galilee listening to this sermon, if they had not accepted Jesus as their Messiah, and he went on to go ahead and set up his kingdom, or, I mean, he didn't, if he didn't die on the cross, then guess what? They would have been killed. They would have never got in that kingdom. He's going to wipe everybody out. That's going to happen in the tribulation. He would have wiped them all out. So their salvation... This, these Jews, the, the salvation we're talking about here is physical salvation or physical death. Because if they hadn't accepted Jesus, they're going to die with everybody else because he's going to kill them. 
And so we're not necessarily talking about salvation of the soul right there. But when did the golden rule stop, stop being a part of the plan of salvation? Somebody read Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. All right. So when did the law and the prophets end for salvation? John the Baptist. It's right there, John the Baptist. And so we see that, you know, and this is taken out of Luke. Y'all remember, uh, uh, y'all remember what the rendering of, of that passage in Matthew was? Let's just look at it. See, right here he's talking about to us the church. It's in Luke. Remember, Luke's written to the Gentile. The law and the prophets were until John. And look at the second sentence in that. Since that time, the kingdom of God, we're not talking about kingdom of heaven right here, we're not talking about Jewish kingdom, we're talking about the kingdom of God, has been preached and everyone is passing into it. Where is that? Matthew 3. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Somebody help me. I can I can quote it by it it says uh three one through twelve. Yeah. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying yeah. the, answer, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There we go. And uh and and so that passage there in Matthew goes on to say that the law and the prophets were until John, uh, and since John, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and violent men have taken it by force. You remember we talked about that passage before, and how there's no way they could be talking about the kingdom of God because violent men can't touch the kingdom of God, but they can touch the kingdom of heaven. And what he was talking about right there is that uh, that that the law and the prophets were until John, and so uh, this salvation. This, this golden rule, this all of these things Jesus is talking about are no longer a part of salvation because uh, it ended with John. But verse number four says, what replaced the law as a means of salvation? Somebody read Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all and on all who believe. For these there is no difference. So there you go. So what was the what was the law <coughs> replaced with? It was replaced with the righteousness of God apart from the law. Because so what was what righteousness was the law based on? Man's what you do. Do this. You do this. X, Y, Z. To however many hundreds of commands there were, all you do this and you will live by them. Or you don't do this. The law is all based on the righteousness of man. Are you able to live up to this set of rules? And if you are, then we're going to call you righteous. Problem is nobody can live up to all the set of rules. But that's the, that's the standard. But it says now the righteousness of God. Now, now we're talking about perfection because the righteousness of God is perfect. And that's how we're saved. It says being revealed, witnessed. So the, it says witnessed by a law. That means all of this Old Testament is point, pointing toward the Lord Jesus Christ coming. All of it. It's all about him. Yes, sister. That is the gift from God, right? Amen. Amen. And so, and so all of the law and prophets... Uh, they were used by God to to as uh, to save men in the Old Testament, but that wasn't the ultimate goal of it. It was really to all point toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in Hebrews, the reason for it. Somebody read Romans four six. Just as David, just as David also de describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So imputes righteousness, remember that means he puts righteousness on you. It doesn't come from you, he gives it to you. And that's what makes us perfect. 
So blessed is whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Got no, you being righteous has got nothing to do with you following the law, following the Ten Commandments, following the Golden Rule, none of that stuff. Your righteousness comes because God put his righteousness on you when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's imputed righteousness. And that's where, uh, uh, that's where the, the, these uh, demonic so-called Christian denominations Apart from it, so you take the Catholic Church in their in their catechism, in their in their uh, doctrine, their dogma, they say that anyone that believes in imputed righteousness, let them be accursed. You believe that? Look at that Bible just said. Blessed is the man who God imputes righteousness, and that church says you'll be damned if you believe in imputed righteousness. Because what do they teach? They teach you got to work to get to heaven. You gotta take the mass, you gotta do penance, you gotta do confession, and you gotta blah, 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 the rosary, all that nonsense to get to heaven. Right there, the word of God says, imputed righteousness. I give it to you. Not based on what you do. And and we see this again and again and again. Somebody read Romans 10, uh, 10 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Well, okay, now there's a qualifier at the end of that passage, right? Everyone who believes. So what does that say to everybody else out there? They still got a law to follow, right? Can, can you imagine? I'm going to just think about this. It says right here, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. So that means if you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the law is not going to be applied to you at the judgment. Jesus is taking care of it. You're perfect. Can you imagine being at the great white throne judgment as a lost person? And you're standing there, and God judges you according to the Ten Commandments. And we know how, how we know how Jesus interprets the Ten Commandments because I mean we we even read back there you know wherever he was say talking about adultery you know uh, you say you know uh, I say if you look with a lump woman with lust so so we know the Ten Commandments go beyond just the physical actions so what's going on in your head so just think about them Ten Commandments thou shalt not. You broke every single one of them. I'll bet everyone in here broke every single commandment. I mean, there might be some, you know, there could be somebody that never stole something, but I, you know, most folks steal stuff, especially when they're kids, you know. They'll steal a piece of candy or a pencil or what, something. Dr. Just, Pepper lip gloss. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I stole a, uh, I stole a decoy duck one time. Oh. I, kept, I'm gonna tell you, I kept that decoy duck for years and years. I mean, I was grown. I was already saved. And I seen that thing in the deal, and I said, I stole that, and I burned it in the stove. It was wood. Anyway, uh, you broke them all. And so, so for those folks that said, I, I was talking to a guy the other day, uh, uh, and, and witness to witness to him and all this and and uh, and and he had he had grown up in a, in a church of of some kind and and he had decided that uh, that God was going to give him a second chance after he got in hell so he kind of believed in hell but he was like I, I'm gonna I believe God's gonna give me a, a second chance and uh, and there ain't no second chances in hell. You're going to be judged by them Ten Commandments. And, uh, and you know, in the Scripture, says, so let's just say, uh, and there's six, 600 and some other commandments, and we know that James says you broke one part of the law, you break it all. So even if there was somebody that had only broke one of the commandments instead of all ten of them, the Word says you break one, you broke them all. And so... Uh, there's going to be some folks that are judged by that law, but praise God, we're not. If you're born again and you're here, you're not. The Christ is the end of the law for those who believe. Yes, ma'am. My heart's screaming. i got to say this. Jesus says, I give you a new law. Yeah, the law of Christ. And you know there's more commands than the law of Christ than there is the law of Moses? 
Are you living by those? Those commands don't get you in heaven, but you're supposed to be living by them. Isn't it the least we could do? I mean, God saves us from a devil's hell, from eternity burning in the devil's hell. Would, isn't it the least we could do to follow his commands? Jesus says, I know you love me because you follow my commands. How many Christians are following Jesus' command? Lord, help me. I know I fail miserably. I'm trying, but a lot of Christians don't even try. They just, I got heaven made. Jesus died for me on the cross. I'm just going to enjoy life. Oh, it's going to be a terrible day at the judgment seat of Christ. For all of us, but especially those that just are using their freedom that God given them as a license to sin. Lots of Christians do that. Number five says, why does following the golden rule for salvation damn people to hell in the church age when it was used to be a part of the plan of salvation under the law? Well, we've already read this and we've already kind of hammered this home. Somebody go ahead and read that again. You can't read Romans 10, 3 too much. Somebody read that again. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Established to seeking their own righteousness. So God, God already told us that Christ is the way. He's the end of the law. So anybody that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ in this age, in the church age, in the age of grace, they're, say, they're seeking to establish their own righteousness. It's like this guy I was talking about. He, he's trying to establish his own righteousness. He's going to take his chances with God. You don't want to take your chances with God, man. You, you do not want to take your chances with God. You know why? He'll burn you. He'll burn you forever. Without mercy. There ain't a single person of us in here that would burn anybody forever without mercy. Would you? You wouldn't. Your worst enemy. Uh, you sitting there watching Adolf Hitler burning and screaming uh, for a few hundred years, you're going to say, ah, that's probably enough. God won't. He'll burn you forever. You don't want to take your chances with God. You want to be perfect like he's perfect. And ain't just but one way to do that. And that's what they're doing, uh, following this golden rule or whatever set of laws that you have made up or whatever religion is made up that says, okay, if you can check all these boxes, you're in. That is a seeking to establish your own righteousness, not the righteousness of God. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee. Oh, wrong. wrong. <laughs> I knew he already came right now. <laughs> Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in it, go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. What is the broad road to destruction? I used to be confused about this many years ago, and I've pre preached on it before. You know, I, I, I would just, I'm going to tell you what, I've been preaching for, I don't know, 25 years or something like that. If I went back and listened to my sermons for the first 10 years of my life, I would want to crawl in a hole. I'm serious. I want to crawl in a hole. Now, I'm not saying God didn't use that. I mean, you know, the gospel is the, what saves you. And I mean, you can, as long as you get it right on the gospel, uh, praise God. But there, there are so many things that I got wrong. I used to always think about the broad gate to destruction was just, you know, secular society. You know, everybody, you know, just partying and all of that stuff. That's the lifestyle I can. That's not the broad road to destruction. That's not the broad road to destruction. The broad road to destruction. Oh, let me say this first. Verse number six. Who do we know the gate to be? So it talks about this narrow gate. Uh, so somebody read John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And somebody read John 10, 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. 
So we know who the gate is, right? The narrow gate. The narrow gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most hated scripture in the world right here. The most hated scripture in the world. Try saying this scripture on CNN. Or try saying that scripture to somebody, one of these uh, uh, celebrities or one of these athletes or what, like maybe after the Super Bowl, somebody quote this scripture right here. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. How quick do you think they'd cut that feed off? Because what that is saying is everyone on the planet Earth is doomed to hell unless you come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And people hate that, man. They hate it. He's the gate. He's the narrow gate. And uh, and it says right there in the end that there are few who find it. I'm going to tell you, folks, you, don't, you just don't realize how few people are going to make it. Churches are plumb full of people that are going to go to hell. Uh, they go to church every Sunday. They're good folks. They love their kids. They pay their taxes. They don't cuss. They don't strength. They don't smoke. Uh, they don't fight, and they're going to burn because they've never put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're counting on what they're doing to get them where they want to go. It is the narrow gate. It is the narrow gate. Uh, and so remember the context. So we know Jesus is the gate, right? He tells us. That's him talking right there. Both of those scriptures is Jesus himself saying, I mean, I'm the gate. I'm the way. But he hadn't said that whenever he's talking to these people preaching the Sermon on the Mount. That's, a, that's afterward. So number seven says, Jesus did not reveal the truths at the time of the Sermon on the Mount. What point was he trying to make of the Jews he was preaching to? We want to always go back and get the context, y'all. It's easy to jump ahead and just make the spiritual application to us, but we want to keep in our mind, what's Jesus saying at the time that he's standing on the side of that uh see and talking to these folks and he had not said I'm the way yet so what did they understand him to mean by that you got to go back to the Old Testament that's all they got is the Old Testament and Jesus hadn't revealed all of these he's beginning to reveal all these things so what did those people sitting there listening to the Sermon on the Mount think Jesus was talking about somebody read Proverbs 14 12 there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There you go. There's another proverb that is exactly that verbatim. I could have put it in there. I can't remember which one it was. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end is a way of death. This seems right. Don't follow that. Don't that seem right? That would be the right thing to do to get to heaven. Doing the right thing, doing good things. That's the right way, right? And the end is going to lead you to death. If you follow that golden rule, trying to get you to heaven, if the golden rule, can we all agree the golden rule is a good thing? Treat others as you want to be treated. Can we all agree that's good? Yes. That's a way that seems right. Because it is right. But if you're going to count on that to get you to heaven, where is it going to lead? Death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. And so those Jews sitting on the side of that lake and Jesus talking about all this new stuff, they're going to go back in their mind and say, okay, there's something. That we thought all this was right, but man, we had a lot of this wrong. It seemed right. Obviously, it's wrong. We need to listen to this guy and figure out what's right. Because later on, he's going to tell them, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes far except through me. And so that's the context of what they would have thought he was saying right there. Let's look at this broad road to destruction. Uh, somebody read Luke uh, 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow gate for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. See, it's, it's, I'm telling you, the religion is the broad road to destruction. Religion. Religion. And it's all religions. It's, it's uh, uh, all religions that don't recognize Jesus Christ as the only way. They're all the broad road to show. Because they all seem right. How many times have you heard uh, uh, 
Maybe you were a new Christian. Maybe you've asked this question. I bet you have. I think I even asked this question whenever I first got saved. What about all the other folks? What about uh, what about the good Muslims? Or what about the good Hindus? You know, I mean, God just going to burn all them people? I mean, really, come on, is he? It's a way that seems right. But the end thereof is death. Somebody read John 10, 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Mm-hmm. And then we've read this uh, Romans 10, 3 several times. The broad road to destruction is religion establishing to seek their own righteousness. Uh, it, the, the, all religions, again, have one thing in common. They all say you can get there. Here's how you do it on your own. And if you follow this set of rules, you're good. And that seems right. It seems logical. But we know it's not because the Lord Jesus Christ says you've got to be perfect. And the only way you're going to be perfect is he makes you that way. And I've already answered that question. What do all other religions besides biblical Christianity have in common? We beat that horse till he's plumb dead. It is all based on your righteousness, not the righteousness of God. That's what they all have in common. All religions are based on your righteousness. And biblical Christianity is based on Jesus' righteousness. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. All right, who is it that leads, who directs people down the broad road? False prophets. And in our age, false teachers. You remember there's a differentiation. We talked about this last week. In the Old Testament, you had false prophets. We don't have prophets today, regardless of what you're going to hear on the Internet. All of these deceived people that are putting these prophecies out, it's nonsense. Absolute, 100% nonsense. Just ignore them. And they'll, they'll prophesy, and they'll miss a prophecy, and you know what they do? They just keep on prophesying. When they're supposed to be put to death, they ought to be killing them folks. That's what they did in the Old Testament. When you prophesy something, how many, how many of these internet prophets prophesied Donald Trump would be uh, president right now instead of Joe Biden? Every one of them suckers in the Old Testament would be dead. Be dead. But you know what they're doing? They're still on the internet. And they just moved on and said, well, wrong about that. Here's what I'm prophesying today. Old Testament was prophets. New Testament, false teachers. False teachers. And that's the people that put you on a broad road to destruction. Churches are full of them. And some false teachers know what they're doing. They're absolute agents of Satan. They're consciously aware that they are deceiving. And there's some false teachers that are just, you could have called me a false teacher. She's not mad and leaving. She's already told me that. (laughs) She said, we're going to get up and leave. I said, so you're not storming out because of something I said? Uh. So there are some false teachers. I'm going to tell you what. I've been a false teacher. There have been times in my life as a Christian that I was teaching stuff that I later found out, that ain't what that meant. I just told you. Uh, my, my early days of preaching, I, I, I knew the Lord had, you know, wanted me to do this and all that, but I didn't have everything right. So... I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't send anybody to hell. I never had the gospel wrong. Praise God. But there's a lot of things that I've taught and a lot of doctrines I've taught in the past that were not right. And you could call me legitimately a false teacher. If I was teaching it and it was false, what am I? False a false teacher. And I'll answer for that. I'll answer for that at judgment seat of Christ. Uh, but false teachers put people on the broad road to destruction when their false teaching is about the gospel. See, if, 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 the, if they are teaching another gospel or another Jesus, see, like a Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and folks like that, they're teaching another Jesus. I tell you what, we went out there to Utah. Remember, brother, when we went to the temple? Were you with us when we went to the temple? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about 
uh, a wild and neat. I mean, they have the walls in that thing. We weren't in the temple itself, or they don't want us in there, but I mean, in the compound. They have these murals, these paintings of Jesus all through the New Testament. The disciples, I mean, just immaculate paintings. And you're looking, and it's depicting what we're reading in this book. It's not the same Jesus. Because that Jesus, they got painted on that wall. God created him. He's just like the devil. He's just a created being. He's not God. He's not the Son of God. See, it's a different Jesus. Same with the Jehovah's Witness. God, a Jesus is created. He's a created being. You know, the Jehovah's Witness come to your door. Uh, you know, I used to just turn away, and then after I got to know the Bible a little better, I would visit them. Uh, that Do not right. let them in your house. <laughs> first John, First John. I mean, First John three is it? The elect lady that in that the it's, I think it's First John three. Uh, don't let them in your house. Uh, but you can talk to them on the porch. You talk to them on the porch, and I, those guys, you, you, the, you know, I'll ask them. I, the last time those guys came, uh, one of the guys there was a uh, used to be a Baptist, and uh, and I and I'd nail them on this. Uh, God is God created? I mean, is Jesus created? And the, the the Baptist, he wasn't the older of the two. The older guy, man, he, he was you know Jesus created. I could see that old Baptist boy was squirming a little bit, but. But these false teachers put you on the broad road to destru destruction when they fool with the gospel. Now, false teaching is bad no matter what it is, but you can go to heaven and have bad doctrine in some area. You got the wrong gospel, you got the wrong Jesus, you're going to go to hell. That's uh, the broad road it puts you on. Um, all right. What are some striking characteristics of false prophets and false teachers? We're going to see how you can, you can't, you can't uh, single out all of these people because you know some of them are are more sly than others. But there are some telltale signs that the Word of God gives us where you can spot a false teacher. Somebody read First Second uh, Peter two one. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Who will secretly bring in destruct, destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction? And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So this is common between all false teachers, regardless of what they look at. What do they do? First of all, like I said before, uh, again, but there were, that's past tense, there were false prophets. That's Jews. That's talking about in the Old Testament. That's talking everybody up to the John the Baptist. There were false prophets. And then what does he say? Even as there will be, that's future. Prophets, past tense. False teachers, future. This taught church age now, as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And so these people are subtle. You know, you know, the most effective heresy is truth mixed with error. You know, the, the blatant error, everybody's going to catch that. What you, what's hard to catch is whenever they tell you truth and they just sprinkle a little error in there. I was listening to one of my favorite teachers, John Barnett. I can recommend him to anybody. And he has a really great teaching on the Catholic Church. And he was talking about uh, uh, Catholicism is like, I think, I think it's what he said, is that Catholicism is like a nice cold glass of uh, a sweet iced tea with a drop of arsenic in it. <laughs> That's right. It looks good, it tastes good, and it'll kill you. And so they bring destructive heresies. And it says many will follow their destructive ways. So that's common among false teachers. But now let's look at some physical characteristics of some of these guys. Somebody read Mark 12, 38. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces. So they got two characteristics there. Long robes and, and love greetings. 
That's a, that's a sign. You see that? You see long robes, and you're like, you need to, you need to say, I mean, it's not, it's not an automatic. But anytime you see anybody in a long robe, and they're up there, to, and, and that's not just Catholics, man. I mean, there's a lot of you Protestant denominations. These guys get up there in robes. I'm not automatically damning them to hell because they're wearing a robe. But hey, you just need to remember what does the Word of God say. Somebody read Matthew 23, 9. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Woo! So, so false teacher, man, I mean, if, if anybody wants to be called father, you need to, whoa, wait a minute. I mean, first of all, that's a direct violation of Scripture. Do not call any man father. And we're not talking about your biological daddy. We're talking about your spiritual. Somebody read Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So for, first of all, they're going to recognize Jesus as Lord. Uh, that's that's a, that's a characteristic of a false teacher. So they're not coming out and denying Jesus. They're saying He is our Lord. You got these Catholic priests. What do they say? They claim. You know what? Their Catholics are fundamentalist. If you look at the fundamentals, have you heard of fundamentalist? I'm a fundamentalist, but I'm Catholic's fundamentalist. Just look at what the fundamentals of the faith are according to funnel, the. the the definition of fundamentalist. Believe in the virgin birth and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and all those things. I believe in all that stuff. See, they 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 claim Jesus is Lord. That's a characteristic. Can I give a witness about something? Let me finish and then we'll get it. Uh, and so uh, that's another characteristic. They're not just going to come out and start denying Jesus. You got these progressive Christians today? Uh, did y'all see? Did anybody watch the Super Bowl? Did you see this ad on the Super Bowl that yeah. we get? He gets us ad, you know. Mm -hmm. And you got you got the Catholic priest that's washing queer's feet, you know. And it's all about this foot washing and everything. You got a woman in front of an abortion clinic, and you got somebody washing her feet and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, they claim Jesus is Lord. That's what they claim to be doing, is introducing Jesus. And it's a false, false. So, uh, and here's the last one, Mark 7, 6. Somebody read that. He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching in doctrines the commandments of men. There you, that last one is so incredibly important. They teach doctrines of men, traditions, Church traditions, religious traditions, they equate that with Scripture. Now, I'm picking on the Catholic Church because it all came out of that, and that's why they need to be picked on. But, but that's what they do. The, the, the Catholic Church and even Protestant denominations, they elevate the teachings and doctrines of men as equal to Scripture. The Eastern Orthodox do the same thing. Many people do, many of these people do the same. So look at these characteristics. First of all, they, they focus on the doctrines of men instead of the Word of God. And we can identify some of them, you know, wearing long robes, being called Father, uh, uh, recognizing Jesus as Lord. All of those are signs of that. Okay, sister, what you got? Um, it's not about the Catholics, it's about Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so these things, these these false teachers can come anywhere. I'm telling you, churches, evangelical churches, all over, everywhere, uh, have got false teachers in them. And so you got to be aware. That's why we're studying this book, right? We want to have it in the book.